Good evening, Pacific Northwest. And friends, families of those who have gone before us, from a grieving heart to another, I greet you. Good evening tonight. There's a phrase in Ilocano, my, my native dialect, which goes, Adula Amin. Can you try saying that with me? Adula Amin. Now, when you say this phrase, it's always said in a critical, dismissive tone. Adula Amin? It's roughly translated, it means, what for? Why even bother? My father, who was a very practical man, who disliked excessive fanfare, used to say this phrase a lot. Adula Amin. He would take down any and every proposal that we would, show, uh, would bring his way to celebrate life's milestones. And he would just downplay it and say, Adula Amin. What for? Why even bother? Tonight, we are taking time to remember those in our community of faith who died in the past year and have done ritual acts in memorial and remembrance. And we do this year after year after year at annual conference. So I dare ask the question, what for? With the limited time that, that we have and all the work that needs to be done at an annual conference, why do we even bother to pause and remember? And I ask that in a, in, uh, not in a dismissive Adula Amin tone, I, but rather, I, I, I ask that as an invitation for us to reflect on what it is that we are actually doing when we remember. What is it that we are truly doing when we come together in memorial? And what is it that happens in our hearts and in our souls? when we come together in this way. But first, a little bit about myself. My name is Carlo Rapanut. I am a clergy member of the Pacific Northwest Annual Conference, assigned as, uh, appointed as um, Alaska Conference Superintendent. My pronouns are he, him, and his, or in my native Tagalog, sha, sha, kaniya, which are all gender neutral. I am husband to Raddy and father to Caleb and Titus. I am a first generation immigrant from the Philippines, a long distance runner, and since November of last year, an orphan. I lost both my parents late last year in the middle of the busiest season for superintendents, charge conference season. Mama died on the first day of our prof professional church workers retreat and fall rendezvous meetings in, in Alaska, which for, for your context, it is one of only three major conference gatherings where we are able to bring mostly everybody from, from all of the uh, local churches across the state to come together. Papa died 43 days later, just as I was starting to go back into my work routine. Now in Filipino tradition, when, when somebody passes away, when somebody dies, it is our practice to hold a wake 
typically lasting seven days before the burial, but, but could be longer depending on where all the extended family, immediate family and extended family were coming from. And so, so we would wait. So let, let me describe, put you in context as, as to what happens in a wake. Typically, there's the, the casket is there. It's, it's usually open. It's sealed, but, but you can see the body of the deceased, uh, and it's, it's at the home of, of the family or at a, a memorial chapel. And a member of the immediate family is expected to be there at all times to sit by the casket and watch. I heard that this had Irish roots. And the word wake is actually uh, that the family, somebody needed to stand by. I mean, this was before all the medical advancements to make sure that if the person wasn't dead and they would wake up, that somebody was there to welcome them back. So, so a member of the family was expected to be there. Friends and family came to visit. Devotions and services were held, if, if, especially if, if they, the family was of a clergy person or was related to a faith community. Meals were shared. Stories were told. Memories were revisited. There was lots of laughter. And there was lots of tears. And sometimes there were no words. People just came and sat with us, grieving, mourning, remembering in silence. I had to travel back home to the Philippines twice for each of, of mama and papa's wakes. Not because I had to, as dictated by my culture and my tradition, but because I needed to. I needed the time and the space to grieve and to mourn and remember, even as part of me was screaming to move on because there was work waiting to be done. The wake allowed me to live in the space where I was not avoiding or denying, but intentionally carrying the weight of my loss. Grief comes from the Latin gravis, which means weighty or, or heavy. Now, remembering as a community of faith gives us a wake-like place where we are able to, to notice and deal with the weight of the loss, where we acknowledge the heaviness that death has laid upon those among us who have lost loved ones, and that weight that is also upon ourselves. Remember and create space to acknowledge our individual and our collective loss. And that life as individuals, as families, as churches, as, and even as an annual conference will never be the same. Because part of us is already gone. Now, one thing I realized from, from my recent experience of wakes and, and, and in, really in, in reflecting on, on the why of annual conference memorials is that both the wakes and memorial services are what the mystics call liminal spaces. Patrick Scriven wrote about this in his blog a, a couple of weeks ago. Liminal from the Latin limen, 
means threshold. And it is the space in between what was and what's next. It's this, this space in between. It's, it's the space between the life as you know it with your loved ones and the life that is yet to unfold with their memory, but without them anymore. This time of remembering and memorial allows us to enter into a similar yet collective liminal space between our life that was with these saints that we just remembered and the life that is still unfolding in the life of our community of faith without them anymore. To remember is to call back, to call back to mind, to, to bring back to consciousness, which when you come to think of it is, is kind of countercultural to a society that wants, wants us so much to move on from the grief as quickly and as, as, as quickly as possible, to get done with its stages as soon as we can, to make it a celebration of life so that in the service we're, we are all rejoicing and not weeping and crying, to mask the pain and the loss. More often than not, friends, we try to breeze through grief, and there seems to be a general aversion to carrying the weight that it brings. The time in between is a most difficult time to be in. We don't want to be there. We want certainty. We want What's, what happens next? We want to move on to what, what the next chapter brings. And yet, as activist and theologian Christina Cleveland reminds us, and I quote, we have a sacred choice. We can remain addicted to certainty because it seems to serve as an anchor in our often troubling world. Or we can, br or we can bring to discover we can begin to discover that plenty lies within the mystery as we loosen our grip on certainty. Father Richard Rohr, one of the mystics of our time, has this to say about liminality. Father Rohr says, we have to allow ourselves to be drawn into liminality. All transformation takes place here, in this space, between what was and what is yet to be. He continues and says, we have to allow ourselves to be drawn out of the business as usual and remain patiently on the threshold where we are between the familiar and the completely unknown. There alone is our old world left behind. And while we are not yet sure where the new existence is going to be and what that's going to look like, this is a good place to be. This is where genuine newness can begin. Richard Rohr says, get there often in that liminal space and stay there as long as you possibly can for whatever means possible. It's the realm where God can best get, us, be, get at us because our false certitudes are finally out of the way. So why even bother with the memorial service, you may ask? Because it reminds us of our constant need to continually enter into liminal spaces to be comfortable with the spaces in between. To put in more familiar terms, liminal space is crossover space. 
Friends, something died in February in St. Louis. And we find ourselves in liminal space today, in between what was and what is yet to be. Now, our faith gives us hope that there is something that is yet to be. There is that promise of what is yet to be. But the stories of our faith also remind us that God is at work even in the liminal spaces. God is at work even in the time in between. Bishop Elaine talked about the creation story, that even while creation was unfolding, was in that liminal space of ongoing work, no longer this, but not yet that, God called it good. The wilderness was a liminal space for the Israelites for 40 years when they were in between the land of slavery and the land of promise. And God was with them, leading, guiding, undoing, and transforming. It was in that liminal space between being a carpenter and being a rabbi that God's words came to Jesus at his baptism and affirming his call. You are my beloved. You're doing the right thing. You got this. Friends, we are in liminal space, and God is at work with us even now. Never give up on that truth. We are living in liminal space right now, yet God is with us even now. Our theology of grace supports this, and we are reminded over and over again that we are moving on to perfection. We are not yet there. And yet, even as we move on to what is yet to be, we are assured of God's grace at work even now. My beloved friends who are sitting in the first two rows, and those of you who are at the tables who have lost loved ones or who have lost communities of faith or are going to lose communities of faith and are living in that liminal space of grief right now. Don't rush it. It's okay to be there in that space and know that we are with you in that space. Know that I am with you in that space. And more importantly, know that God is there with us as we move from what was to what is next. It'll take time. People and circumstances will want to rush you. You will want to rush yourself through this. But remember that there is value in staying in that liminal space for a while and let God be present there and work in your grieving heart. And beloved siblings in the Pacific Northwest Conference, we are clearly living in liminal space right now. And the memorial service reminds us that it's okay to be in this space. Now, Jesus gives us but one guideline as we live in this liminal space, as, as we live in this space in between. We are reminded by, by, our, by, by, by our other text today that it was in the liminal space, in that same liminal space, that the lawyer approached Jesus with what I would like to believe was a sincere question Teacher, what must I do to gain eternal life? What must I do to get from where I was 
to where I want to be. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And love your neighbor as you love yourselves. Love like this. Beloved, as we find ourselves in this liminal space where we are in between what was and what will be, Jesus invites us that in our differences, that we not beat each other up out of frustration or anger expressed in senseless complaints and church trials and ugly lawsuits, but rather to love like this. As John Wesley said, though we may not think alike, may we not love alike. I invite you to turn to somebody whom you know has different belief systems, theologies than you in this room. Just, just make eye contact with somebody whom you know varies diametrically from you, even in this issue of inclusion. Make eye contact and say to that person, though may, we may not think alike, may we not love alike. For even if we seem to be headed towards an inevitable split, could it be that our last acts as the United Methodist Church, as we know it, could it be that our last act would be not of hatred and animosity, but out of love and respect for one another? Beloved, we are in liminal space. And that's okay. Know that God is at work even now through the mess, through the uncertainty, through the questions, and through the fog. God is working, transforming, making all things new. Amen. Would you join with me in this prayer for our faithfully departed? O God of both the living and the dead, we praise your holy name for all your servants who have faithfully lived and died. We thank you for the sacred ties that bind us to those unseen who encompass us as a cloud of witnesses. We pray that, encouraged by their example and strengthened by their fellowship, we may be diligent followers, and that nothing will be able to separate us from your love. In Christ Jesus our Lord, amen.